Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories. I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hello, hello, hello. Today we're back with a new episode. Welcome back, everyone. So glad to have you here. We're on episode number 131. And today we're going to be talking about superstitions. Now, we live in a day and age that is driven by science and technology, yet people are still superstitious. According to a study I read by YouGov, 9% of Americans claim to be superstitious, while another 35% admit to not being very superstitious, but somewhat. That makes over 40% of individuals in the United States somewhat superstitious. So what does it mean to be superstitious? According to Cambridge Dictionary, it is to have beliefs that are not based on human reason or scientific knowledge, but are connected with old ideas about magic. Many times, superstitious people believe in irrational, unproven signs of good and bad luck. In today's episode, we're going to go through 13 common superstitions in the United States and their origins. By the end of this audio lesson, you'll walk away with more knowledge about American culture and some new vocabulary and phrases. I'll teach those as we go along. Before we begin, I'd like to give a big shout out to Helen Dennis, Florent, Ricardo Farias, Arg Grisha, Arturo Godoy, Robert, Isa Correa, Naishing Tan, and the other contributors who didn't write their names, but bought me coffee. A while back, I put a link in the show notes that enables listeners to support this podcast and my work through small donations. Let me just say I appreciate these contributions so much. My daughters and I go on little dates for ice cream and coffee or smoothies. Obviously, they don't drink coffee, but we think about you guys as we indulge. That's just really cool. If you have learned something on this podcast and want to support it, that link is in the show notes. Or it's also really helpful if you share this podcast with your friends. Posting reviews on Apple and Spotify also help out. It helps getting the word out to people that don't know this podcast. And I truly, truly appreciate it. So thank you to everyone who has supported. As you listen to this lesson today, I want you to think about yourself and the culture of your country. Are you superstitious? What sorts of superstitions exist around you? In English, there's sort of a negative connotation to the term superstitious. Yet, the truth is, superstition is all around us. Before we begin the 13 common superstitions, we have to talk about superstition in U.S. sports. Did you guys know that many American athletes have lucky routines? Tiger Woods, one of the U.S.'s most famous golfers, always wears red during a final match because it's his power color, lucky red. The professional American tennis player and five-time Wimbledon champion Serena Williams has a very funky routine. She always takes a shower with her sandals on, brings those sandals to court with her, ties her shoes in a very specific way, and then bounces her tennis ball five times before starting the match. Now, the most awarded Olympian in history with 28 medals is Michael Phelps an American swimmer. And he always starts a race the same way. He takes off his headphones, swings his arms in circles three times, and then jumps off the block. Now, why? <laughs> there is a tendency for superstitions to arise in stressful, competitive places, 
since it gives those involved a sense of control. After all, to get consistent outcomes, you got to stick to the same routines, right? The predictability of a routine, no matter how goofy it is, can improve one's confidence and therefore an ability to perform. Many athletes admit to wearing lucky underwear, lucky shirts, or lucky talismans around their necks or wrists or in their pockets as they perform. A talisman is an object, sometimes a ring or a stone, that brings good luck. Now, what's funny about items like these is the better you perform with your lucky object, the luckier it becomes, right? This is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and maybe a result of confirmation bias. If you believe in something, you look for evidence to support it. Confirmation bias. So my question to you is, have you ever worn a lucky shirt or used a lucky color? Have you ever done a ritual before a sporting event or presentation? Now, that's all about good luck. There's a flip side to this. There is bad luck in sports as well. Some athletes may refuse to wear certain numbers on their jerseys or on their race cars because they're unlucky. There was a documentary I watched in preparation for this called Superstitious Minds, and a well-known race car driver, Alex Tagliani, like other superstitious racers, refused to race in cars with double-digit numbers. By double-digit, I mean 11, 22, 33, 44. And the reason is, there have been so many tragic car accidents with those numbers, with double-digit numbers. Even those who may not admit to being superstitious might still avoid those double-digit numbers. Because why not? If you can control something, you might as well, right? Without any further ado, let's talk about the 13 common superstitions in the U.S. and their origins. Number one, find a penny and pick it up. All day long, you'll have good luck. A penny is a one cent piece. So if you have some American money in front of you, look for the copper coin with Abraham Lincoln on the front and the Lincoln Memorial on the back. Nowadays, a penny isn't worth much, unfortunately. <laughs> but if you see one on the ground, especially with Lincoln's face up, you gotta pick it up. That's a lucky penny. We have a saying in the U.S., which is, find a penny, pick it up, all day long, you'll have good luck. Some sources say this saying comes from an old nursery rhyme about pins. Since pins used to be expensive, it was a lucky day if you found one. 33% of Americans believe that finding a penny is good luck. According to my aunt, who is not very superstitious, you just got to pick it up because you don't want to mess with the laws of attraction. The point is, most people pick up a penny. Some Americans are very specific, though. Listen to this. There are two sides to every coin. Literally, right? You've got a heads and a tails. On coins in the U.S., the heads always have actual heads on them, usually presidents. One version of the superstition is that the penny is only lucky if you find it heads up, meaning when you can see Lincoln's profile. If it's tails up, then the finder might flip the penny over for another person to find it heads up. Personally, I've always thrown a tails up penny until it lands on heads, and then I'll put it in my pocket. If you ever see someone having some strange interaction with a penny on the ground, you know what's going on. Number two, the number 13. Is the number 13 lucky or unlucky? A long time ago, one of my students told me a fun fact he'd learned about the U.S., and it was that many of our buildings don't have a 13th floor 
because of the superstition that 13 is an unlucky number. We'll talk about that in a second, but let's first talk about the number 13. People who have extreme fear of the number 13 are said to have a condition called triskydecaphobia. And here are a few reasons why the number 13 may be considered unlucky. In 1989, there was a stock market crash on Friday the 13th. Apollo 13, a space mission to the moon, failed when an oxygen tank exploded. It made it back, but yeah, there's a movie about that. In the Bible, Judas, the betrayer, was the 13th guest at the Last Supper. And last but not least, and there's actually many more than this, in Norse mythology, there is a myth in which 12 gods are having a dinner party when an uninvited 13th guest arrived named Loki. Loki had another partygoer named Balder shot with an arrow, and then the earth got dark, and 13 became an unlucky number in Norse mythology. The fear of the number 13 is a real thing. You may know Stephen King, the famous author of horror literature, or FDR, a former U.S. president. Both of them have or had triskydecaphobia. 14% of Americans believe that Friday the 13th is an unlucky day. So what's the deal with the buildings? Is it true that U.S. buildings don't have a 13th floor? Let's use New York City as a sample because there are a lot of high-rises there. In New York City, most of the famous buildings do have a 13th floor. So if you head to the Empire State Building, the Flatiron Building, or One World Trade Center, you will see a 13th floor. However, in 2015, New York City housing data was published and 629 buildings were labeled as high-rises. That means they have 13 or more floors. Only 55 of the 629 had the 13th floor labeled. That means that 91% of high-rises in New York City don't label the 13th floor as the 13th floor. Sometimes it's the 14th floor, 12A, or it's skipped altogether. How wild is that? Is it because all of the hotel owners and apartment complex owners are superstitious? Absolutely not. As the owner of a hotel or apartment complex, you just don't want to risk not having visitors or residents just because a floor is labeled 13. Superstitious or not, that's just bad business. Number three, step on a crack you break your mother's back. Many sidewalks in the U.S. have cracks, those that were intentionally put there by the people that laid the concrete and the ones that were created naturally over time. As a kid, we would do everything possible to avoid stepping on sidewalk cracks because we knew if you stepped on a crack, you could break your mother's back. Today, 7% of Americans consider stepping on a crack bad luck. Many others consider it nonsense. One of the people I asked about this said, well, if I start paying attention to the cracks, then I actually try and avoid them, even though I don't think that it's unlucky or that I'll break someone's back. So, yeah, maybe this stuff is just ingrained in us as children. Number four, knock on wood. Chances are, if you spend a bit of time in the U.S., you'll likely see Americans knock on wood or say knock on wood while speaking about something. This is to ensure good luck or to avoid bad luck. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you have a sick uncle who's 99 years old, and you mention to your mom that you're curious whether he'll be around for his 100th birthday. You feel bad saying something so negative, so in this situation, you might look for a piece of wood to knock on, perhaps a table or a chair. 
By knocking on wood, according to the superstition, you'll avoid having bad luck associated with your original statement. And in effect, your 99-year-old uncle will survive to his 100th birthday. Similarly, if you say something positive, you can reinforce it by knocking on wood. It'll ensure good luck. So the origin of this superstition is uncertain. Many believe it started with the Celts, who believed that gods and spirits lived in trees, and by touching wood, we would show our recognition of their existence. Touching wood would allow us to show our gratitude towards them, and for this reason, they'd bestow good luck upon us, or even protect us against bad luck. Another possibility is that this superstition originated in medieval churches. In medieval churches, pews, were often made of wood. That's the area where you sit and where you kneel if you are in a Catholic church. And the devout who wanted to connect with the divine would touch the wood in front of them. So the British touch wood rather than knock on wood to avoid bad luck or have good luck. In the U.S., once again, it's knock on wood. So do you do this? Be sure to share on Instagram at American English Podcast. Number five, hold your breath while going past a cemetery. A cemetery is a place where we bury the dead. Bury is spelled B-U-R-Y. The coffins were buried in the cemetery or the graveyard. There is a superstition that when you pass a cemetery, you should hold your breath so that you don't breathe in the spirit of a person who recently died. Some say you should hold your breath because by breathing, you'll make ghosts jealous. Out of spite, they might haunt you. While many say this superstition is a little kooky, kooky means strange and eccentric, many families or groups of friends and kids hold their breath just for kicks. For kicks means for fun. Why not? Number six, beginner's luck. A few years back, my family purchased a ridiculous card game called Taco, Cat, Goat, Cheese, Pizza. I know, crazy name, but very fitting for a crazy game. I won't go into the rules, but let's just say it gets my family acting like gorillas, narwhals, and groundhogs, and some players have gotten hurt. My sister-in-law came to visit last weekend and I invited her to join in for a round. The first time she played, she won. And immediately, all of us said, oh, it's just beginner's luck. Beginner's luck is a superstition, and it's the belief that people who are new to something succeed. We call someone who is new to an activity a noob or newbie in American English. So my sister won, even though she's just a noob. Why does this superstition exist? Let's think about it. If you've spent years playing basketball, you don't want to see a noob crush it on their first 10 free throws. To crush it means to do very well at something, right? You'd probably prefer blaming beginner's luck for their success than natural talent. Now, my dad claims he's not superstitious at all, but he believes in beginner's luck. According to him, when you do something for the first time, You come into it with a positive attitude and without much forethought, and as a result, you tend to do well. Do you believe in beginner's luck? Number seven, a black cat crossing your path. So Halloween is on October 31st, and for the first time ever, I bought decorations for the occasion. We have a skeleton hanging from our front door. There are pumpkins on our walkway. I also bought a black cat figurine. It's about the size of a real cat, and he looks sort of goofy, but my girls like him. And so after I brought him inside, he immediately became their new toy. He's often the mommy or daddy cat in their little cat family. (laughs) The point is, the cat has been traveling around our house for the past three weeks. And at one point, I realized... This black cat is constantly crossing my path. Why is it bad luck 
for a black cat to cross our path. The perception of cats as mythical creatures dates back to ancient Egypt and Greece. In Egypt, according to History.com, they were divine, creatures of God. Stories in Greek mythology link cats to magic, especially in stories about Hectate, who was a goddess of sorcery, magic, and witchcraft. Not only could Hectate transform into a cat, but she also used cats as her familiars. A familiar is a demon that takes the form of an animal to assist witches. So basically, her cat was an assistant. And while cats do have a place in Norse mythology and Celtic cultures, it's a 13th century pope named Gregory IX we can thank for associating cats with bad luck. Gregory IX believed that cats were an, quote, incarnation of Satan. He wrote about them in an official church document called Vox of Roma, shortly before witch hunts began in Europe. Witches were seen as a threat to the church, and cats, their accomplices. Number eight, four-leaf clovers. According to Benjamin Radford, a researcher at the American Folklore Society, clovers were once sought after because they helped people ward off witches and allowed them to see fairies. Most clovers have three leaves. A four-leaf clover is extraordinarily rare. Various studies claim that one in 5,000 clovers have four leaves. According to the New York Times, the idea of four-leaf clovers being lucky goes back to the Druids. So people have been saying this forever. Are Americans into four-leaf clovers? Well, some definitely are. The Guinness World Record for most four-leaf clovers collected is held by Edward Martin of Cooper Landing, Alaska. He has 111,060 clovers. One woman from Wisconsin claims that COVID became clovid for her because she tries to find a four-leaf clover every day. Some say we make our own luck. In the 1930s, a man by the name of Charles T. Daniels, who was an amateur horticulturist, figured out how to propagate four-leaf clovers. In other words, he figured out how to (laughs) mutate the genes in order to create them. He settled in St. Petersburg, Florida, and alongside his children, he opened up a four-leaf clover farm in his backyard. Together, they grew millions of four-leaf clovers. Business boomed. People around the world requested keychains, greeting cards, bookmarkers, etc. The farm still exists today under the name Clover Specialty Company. Number nine, to walk under a ladder. A ladder is a structure used to climb up to higher locations or down from them. It has horizontal bars or rungs that you can step on. Many would agree that it's common sense to steer away from ladders. If a ladder is present, there might be construction going on overhead and something can fall on your head. There is a superstition that it's unlucky to walk underneath a ladder. And it's not just because something might fall on your head, although that would be pretty unlucky. When you see a ladder by itself or perched up against a wall, the space underneath looks like a triangle. Triangles have always carried great importance from ancient Egypt, where you find sacred pyramids, to other religions that honor the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Walking under a ladder to those who are superstitious means you're disrupting spirits or you're breaking the Trinity. In doing so, you invite bad luck or the devil. 20% of Americans believe it is unlucky to walk under a ladder. Do you walk under ladders? Number 10 to open an umbrella indoors. 14% out of the 1,220 surveyed claimed that it is unlucky to open an umbrella indoors. Where did this superstition originate? There are a few theories. 
One being that in ancient Egypt, umbrellas were used to protect oneself from sunlight. They were made of papyrus and peacock feathers, and opening them indoors would anger the sun god Ra. Another belief is that the superstition was born in the Victorian era, at the time when umbrellas were invented. Early umbrellas had rudimentary springs, springs that were very basic, and they opened in a way that could be frighteningly dangerous to children or adults, given all of the spokes. The superstition may have begun as a way to prevent people from opening umbrellas in areas where they aren't needed, like indoors, where people can get hurt. On a side note, just the other day, I called my mom talking to her about this topic, and we both realized that we have a hard time buying used umbrellas. There are a lot of stores around here, vintage stores, and in the stores, we've noticed that there are really great looking umbrellas, at least from the outside when they're closed. We want to open them up in the store to see if they're broken, but can't, sort of like a mental block or like a, you know, something impeding us from doing so because it's considered bad luck. We both started laughing hysterically because we both have this issue and because my mom admitted that she's considered buying one, bringing it outside to open it up, check to see if it's broken, and then returning it if it's broken. My mom doesn't even believe it's necessarily unlucky to open an umbrella indoors. She just can't bring herself to do it. According to her, when an idea is ingrained in your head or in your brain as a child, it sticks around, no matter how ridiculous the idea is. Number 11, throw salt over your shoulder. Have you ever seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? There's a classic scene where one of the protagonists, Harry, was told to throw salt over his shoulder to avoid bad luck on a road trip. Instead of throwing the grains of salt, as we normally do, a pinch of salt, he threw the entire salt shaker, and he hit a customer nearby. According to the superstition, spilling salt is bad luck, and to reverse it, you need to throw a pinch of salt over your left shoulder. So why salt? Why the left shoulder? Some trace the practice back to the image of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. In it, you can see Judas with a fallen salt shaker near his elbow. Judas in the Bible is known to have betrayed Jesus, and so the act became associated with disloyalty. It was a sign, or bad sign, that the devil was nearby. And because in Christianity, there was a belief that the devil hangs out over your left shoulder, by throwing salt over your left shoulder, you could blind him. Once again, if you do this, you might want to throw a pinch of salt and not the whole shaker. Number 12, to jinx someone. Today, the word jinx, J-I-N-X, means to bring bad luck to. If I say, you're going to lose your baseball game today, and then you lose, you might tell me that I jinxed your team. I brought you bad luck. I jinxed you. Jinxing has many possible origins, but according to worldwidewords.org, its most probable origin is from a musical comedy from the late 1800s in which the main character, Jinx Hoodoo, was tremendously unlucky. Soon enough, people adopted the word jinx to describe someone who was unlucky. Once again, jinxing is to bring bad luck. Yet, there's another aspect to it that's important to understand. Jinxing someone is a popular, ongoing game in the United States. It never stops. And it goes like this. When you say something at the same time as someone else, any of the parties speaking can say jinx. Whoever says the word jinx first is safe. The person who they jinxed cannot speak until their name is said. If you are jinxed and you speak before the jinx is lifted, you will be unlucky. 
Adults play this, kids play this, and you'll hear it in pop culture. Listen to this clip taken from the popular series, How I Met Your Mother. It all started one day five years ago. Ooh, Van Helsing, jinx. You're jinxed. That means that you can't speak until someone who is present for the jinx says your name or else you will have very bad luck. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Broke the jinx. Marshall, I'm a grown-ass man. I'm not about to stop talking just because I was jinxed. Then Barney goes on and gets hit by a bus. He breaks many bones in his body. And he begins to believe that jinxes bring bad luck. 13. Breaking a mirror brings seven years of bad luck. In ancient cultures, such as in Rome, mirrors were said to reflect both the physical appearance of an individual and also their soul. When you break a mirror, you crack the soul within, and therefore it is considered bad luck. Seven years of bad luck. In fact, 14% of Americans believe this superstition to be true. According to my friends, it's a bunch of hogwash. Hogwash means nonsense, BS. And yet, at the same time, one of them admitted that they wrap old compacts tightly when they throw them out so that the mirror doesn't break inside. A compact is a small, portable, circular container of facial powder. And usually there's a mirror inside so that you can see yourself. It's nonsense, but yes, it still impacts her behavior. So what do you think? Are people from the United States superstitious? Do you feel more superstitious after listening to this episode? Or less so? There are many things that were not mentioned here, such as crossing your fingers, throwing coins in a fountain, making a wish when blowing out birthday candles, having lucky numbers to play in the lottery, such as the number seven. But I think the list here, the 13 mentioned, is pretty solid. Superstition is not only all around us, it's deeply ingrained in culture. According to the documentary Superstitious Minds, the economy loses $2.4 billion each year because of people who refuse to work or travel on Friday the 13th. So one thing I learned from this episode is that the Americans I know, and I apologize for using the term American, I wish we had the term United Statesians for the South Americans listening to this and Central Americans. Um, but yeah, we love talking about this topic. Over the past few weeks, I talked to over 10 people who were overly enthusiastic to share their thoughts and experiences about superstition. First, I called the Otis Elevator Company about the 13th floor in buildings. And the customer service representative died laughing on the phone when she heard my question. I wanted to know how many of their elevators were sold without the 13th floor button. <laughs> then she went into a long story about how all of the high rises she's worked on uh, avoided using the number 13. Yeah, very funny. Many of my friends who I spoke to about this topic started our conversation by saying they're not superstitious at all. And then when I asked if they believed in the 13 things I mentioned here, because I went through the entire list, they were like, oh, wait, I do avoid opening umbrellas inside. Or, oh, I don't ever walk under ladders. And like I said, my dad thinks superstition is whack. It's hogwash. It's nonsense. It's a load of crap and a bunch of brainwash. But he 100% believes in beginner's luck. So people are funny, guys. When I was walking in Rome many years ago, I was pooped on by a bird and a woman yelled out of nowhere, Fortuna! Good fortune. In her opinion, it was lucky to be pooped on by a bird. While I lived in Germany, my German best friend told me that I needed to look into her eyes when I lifted my glass to cheers her. If I didn't, I'd have seven years of bad sex. Hmm? Uh, Lucas told me that one of his good friends from Brazil can't see a Havaiana, the flip-flop, upside down. He has to walk over and flip it over, or it's bad luck. So do you believe in good and bad luck? Do you have lucky numbers that you always play in the lottery? 
do you make wishes when you blow out the candles? I'm not sure whether (laughs) people from the United States are more or less superstitious than others around the world. In the famous words of Michael Scott from The Office, I think we're not superstitious, just a little stitious. (laughs) Hope you enjoyed that episode. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.